Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God. Our sin and our debt overcoming. Jesus. Here is our king, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now, we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong, the blind can see, the lost are found. We had heard the stories of old, yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken, behold freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing, his plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday.
And so we know that it is, in fact, a Good Friday, and that is exactly why. This morning, across the world, we remember the death of our Lord Jesus, and we we're able to say that it's a Good Friday because we know that Sunday is coming. And so this morning, as we gather together as a church, and if you're joining with us for the first time, we invite you to be part of our online family this morning. We really pray that our time together would be a blessing to you, would help you to remember just the significance of this day, of this Good Friday. And so we're going to take communion together um, a little bit later in the service. And so if you haven't prepared, why don't you go and grab some juice or something else that you can drink and some bread or some crackers or anything that you've got just so that when we take communion together, you can participate. And we will lead you through that. What you'd really love is for families that are together to be part of this. So let your children be part of the service. Um, it's not going to be too long. We'd love for families together. But before we do that, before we worship the Lord this morning from all across the city during lockdown, let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much that you are um, the Son of God, that you came, that you lived, and that you died on the cross. And on this day, as we remember your sacrifice, as we remember your death, we ask that this would be a significant time, that our worship, that our offering would be pleasant and a pleasing aroma to you, Jesus. And so would you be honored, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing along with us.
I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life for me. You have been so, so Why could it hurt you? I don't 
deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God, yeah
Well, good morning, church. Today is Easter Friday, one of the most significant moments in our calendar as Christians. And um, it's such a pity that we can't gather together like we normally do um, in person. But we are gathering together online from across the city, from across our nation, from across the world. And that is still fantastic. That is great. We are united together, not only um, in spirit, but in heart and mind as well. And if it is your first time with us this morning, we would love to connect with you. And there'll be a link that will pop up on your screen. Why don't you click that? Let us know that you're joining us. Let us know where you're from. And let us know how we can pray for you and connect with you, even if you're not in our city. Likewise, we are posting daily on our social medias. And, and the links will be also pop up on your screen. And um, we want to remind you that on Sunday, we are going to be celebrating... Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus means nothing if it's not for His resurrection. And so why don't you join us Sunday at 9 a.m. And if you're a part of our Engage service, we'll be having an Engage Hangout as well on Sunday. Uh, so join us for that. We are going to be connecting again next week, Sunday, um, but in person this time because a lockdown is going to be done. And so we just want to encourage you to join us. Let's get together. Let's gather together and let's celebrate um, what God has done in us and through us in this season. See you next week, Sunday. So I wonder if you would agree with me that this is such a beautiful day of remembering not only that Jesus came and died for my salvation, not only what Jesus' death and resurrection means to me, but also that this was the start of establishing the church and the spread of the kingdom of God. And so for me, more than any other day, I think in the year, I'm reminded that this is so much bigger than me, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is so much bigger than just what Jesus accomplished for me and for my sin and for my eternal salvation, but that there's this beautiful mandate that I get to be part of, of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we want to give you an opportunity this morning as you remember the death of Jesus Christ to help us to continue spreading the gospel, help us to connect with people who don't know Jesus, to keep telling the Jesus story, to keep feeding the hungry, to keep clothing the naked, to keep furthering the kingdom of Jesus, even in the season. And so um, you, you might have already given your tithe this month if you're part of our Eastside family. But I want to challenge you this morning. Why don't you give to the Lord an offering of gratitude, an offering that is um, even if it's slightly above what you normally give, even if you have been blessed and you're able to give excessively above what you normally give, why don't you this morning not just bring God an offering of obedience, as we often encourage you to do, church, but this morning really to bring to the Lord an offering of your gratitude for what He has done, and an offering that says, God, I'm all in. I'm partnering with you in furthering the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And I'm partnering with you in helping people to know the love of Jesus, to know the truth of Jesus, and to be fed and to be clothed and to be helped. Um, let's pray together. Father, thank you that you have blessed so many of us. Lord, and in this time, we also want to pray for those who have lack. God, we want to pray for those whose businesses are really struggling in the season of lockdown. We want to pray for families um, whose income has been reduced. Lord, we know that our provision does not come from our jobs. Our provision does not come from our bosses or our companies. But our provision comes from you and you have promised, Lord Jesus, to meet our needs according to your glorious riches. And so we pray especially for those in lack right now, God. But for those of us who have been less, maybe with a little bit more even in this season, Lord, would you take our offering this morning as an offering of gratitude, as an offering of worship, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for what you've done. And we thank you for the privilege that we have of partnering with you in this kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as you give and as the um, means to give are on the screen, we just thought that this clip of some of the last words of Jesus before he went to that cross would be a blessing to you.
Hey there friends, 15 days of lock, lock up, uh, I mean lockdown, I mean it feels like that doesn't it? You know what I wouldn't give to just walk around the block, to take the dogs for a run at the church like I normally would, maybe get on my mountain bike and experience the wide open spaces, but it's not like that now is it? I mean we're all in our rooms wherever we are. Hey before I start, um, I, I just wanted to reach out to you if you're alone or if you know of somebody that's alone that's finding this time a little bit overwhelming. Why don't you let us know? Let us see how we could possibly just reach out to them and be some source of encouragement to them. No one should be alone in this time. Hey, let's, let's have a word of prayer together. Father God, as we get into your word now, we thank you for Jesus who died for us. Holy Spirit, I, I pray that you would make the Jesus story real to every one of us, wherever we are. Help us to understand the good news of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I thought I would share one of the, one of the precious things that I have from my dad. I have several things. I have his tools. I have one or two other things. I have the family rifle. Um, but... And that reminds me of, of some good times with my dad. But you see, I knew my dad for 23 years of my life. For the first 21 years of my life, I knew my dad as somebody who spoke about God. I knew my dad as somebody who prayed, but very little in his life reflected a real living relationship with Jesus. The last two years of his life, that changed. And I have his Bible. I'm not going to read out of it today because it's, the old King James Version, but I have his Bible. In this Bible, there are all kinds of little notes, like this one Yeah, There are verses that are underlined and um, that speaks into, excuse me, um, specific moments in his life as he struggled in those last two years just to get closer and closer to Jesus. It all started with, with a night when I visited, visited him in the hospital when he told me that he had recommitted his life to God. And... And then he got stuck in. He didn't hold back. He was, he was catching up for a lifetime of not being close to God. And I remember his life changing from this to something that reflected the beauty of God in the most amazing way. Maybe your life is like my dad's life. And my prayer has been that if, if some of you are watching this sermon this morning, that, that you would... If you are in that space where you know God, you, exper you, 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 you read the Bible, you pray, but you don't have a living relationship with God, that somehow this message that I'm bringing to you today, the possibilities that happen because of Good Friday, will become real to you. So let's get stuck into it. I, I really want to see if somehow, whether through the preaching of God's Word this morning, we can take you from being nominal to being wholly devoted followers of Christ, from not understanding to fully comprehending what Good Friday is all about. I think when we think about memories, I think it was the same for the disciples as they thought about Jesus. Remember, they walked in the footsteps of Jesus. I think of, of the three disciples and Luke, who, who wrote the story of Jesus for us in the four Gospels. Um, what, what was it like for them? Um, Remembering, <clears throat> remember they walked behind Jesus. They would have been there when Jesus changed the water into wine. When Jesus' mother walked up and told, told them to fill those big water jars and then told Jesus to change the water into wine. What was it like for them? Um, you know, I, th I think of them walking behind Jesus and this blind man shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus turning and healing him. Or, or when they were there and and the little children wanted to connect with Jesus and Jesus opening his arms and, and just loving the children. Um, and what, what, about, what about this little boy? Jesus lands, there's 5,000 people and there's a little boy and he says to them, I uh, says to the little boy, listen, don't you, won't you just lend me your five loaves and two fish just for a moment? And he stands there and Jesus starts feeding 5,000 people. He keeps breaking the bread and just becomes more and more and more takes the fish, breaks the fish up, and and, feed, and Jesus feeds 5,000. Can you imagine the memories that this little boy had? Um, now, 
I don't know if you know this, but the Gospels, if you read the Gospels, there's a lot of detail in the beginning about the birth of Jesus, how the angel came and appeared to Mary, to how the angels appeared to the shepherds, the three magi, and so on. Exactly where Jesus was born in the manger, that there was no place for him. But somewhere between that and the latter part of Jesus' life, his ministry component, there are big gaps. It's almost as if the writers wanted to make sure that we knew exactly what Jesus' life work was all about. And so we, we pick it up from the time of Lazarus' resurrection to the crucifixion. There is significant detail, details about what Jesus did, where he went, and so on. So, so let's read a little bit from that period in the life of Jesus together. We read from Matthew 26 says this this is Jesus at the last supper while they were eating Jesus took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body then he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin I tell you I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, See the detail here? This very night you will fall, all fall away on account of me. We jump a couple of verses to verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Some raw emotion here. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible... May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. My father... If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. These last moments in the, in the life of Jesus is just filled with a lifetime of emotion. Um, remember, remember Jesus told about Lazarus, but that Lazarus is about to die, but he doesn't go. Can you imagine the internal tensions for him or the conversation with the dis disciples? Should I go? Shouldn't I go? You know, they want to kill me in Jerusalem. And then he decides to go. And the disciples even say, hey, let's go and die with him. And then he gets to Lazarus, his house. There Mary and Martha come out and say, Jesus, if you were here, this would not have happened to us. And Jesus just interacting with them, ministering to them and saying to them things like, I am the resurrection. I am the life in my father's house. There are many mansions. I'm, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So Jesus, in his own mind, is in their grief, but also thinking about his own death. And then, I mean, can you imagine being there at the tomb where everyone's just overwhelmed? Lazarus must have been a special person because it says Jesus wept. Can you imagine the talk around the supper table that evening, talking about how Jesus rolled the stone away and called Lazarus out and Lazarus came out and there is Lazarus. I mean, and, and the joy around the table. I mean, so from absolute grief to absolute joy. 
Imagine, imagine Jesus coming into Jerusalem. I mean, by now the word had spread. The one who had fed 5,000, 4,000, the one who made the blind man see, the one who welcomed children, the one who just raised Lazarus from the dead is coming into town and word spreads. And one or two people saying to other people, um, yeah, what's going on? And they go, yeah, the one who, who I was there when he fed the 5,000. I was there when he raised Lazarus from the dead. You must come and see. And so the mood as Jesus comes into Jerusalem is, is overwhelmingly celebratory. And as people take their, their cloaks, throw it in front of Jesus, cut palm branches, throw it down, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. I mean, this was, this was so awesome. In the minds of the disciples, they must have thought, well, the danger is past. There is no reason for us to worry. I mean, Jesus is so popular. Would anyone think of killing him? Well, um, just imagine the mood change as Jesus, as I mean, in the upper room, were they bantering around? I mean, the Passover was obviously a, a celebration in itself. I mean, this was a celebration of Egypt, Israelites leaving Egypt, coming into, coming into the promised land. And that must have been part of this. Part of the, the thought as people prepared, getting ready and making sure all the food is where it needs to be and joking and laughing, the emotion upbeat. Wow, wasn't that a moment in the streets of Jerusalem? And then Jesus brings the mood down. He starts washing the disciples' feet. He starts saying something like, um, in my father's house, um, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I'm leaving you like lambs amongst the wolves. Um, Jesus prays his last prayer. Father, I pray that they may be one as we are one. God, I, I pray not only just for them, I pray also for those who believe. That's us. That, that, that you would help them to be one as we are one. God, will you help them and protect them? I mean, just a lifetime of emotion. I suppose if I had to say what was the climax of the story, I would go to verse 38. And where it says, then Jesus said to them, my soul, my soul is overwhelmed. This is now in the garden of Gethsemane. All the emotion leading up and now it is this time of, of, of deep soul struggle for Jesus. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible... May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Luke, um, the doctor writes later about this time. He says, you know, Jesus was so stressed that he was sweating, but the, the color of his sweat wasn't the color of normal sweat. It was like, it was as if blood was mixed in with Jesus' sweat, um, which helps us to understand that Jesus wasn't just stressful. He wasn't having a little panic attack here. Yeah? Jesus was completely stressed out. And so I suppose we have to ask the question, what was it that made Jesus feel so stressed out? Why was Jesus struggling like this? Um, in trying to think how to explain this, I thought of my own heart operation. For those of you who don't know, I had a procedure done in my heart that would stop my heart from fibrillating. Um, every now and again when I exercised, my heart would just start, start pumping at a ridiculous rate. And so they did a little procedure just to stop the heart and make it pump in its normal fashion. But I remember the two weeks before thinking about um, the procedure, but being so busy and not really having time to think about it. I knew that it was coming, but it was two weeks away, then a week away, then four days away. But the closer we got to the time, the more I remember the time when my dad had open heart surgery and the trauma, the trauma that we as a family went through in that time. The Friday morning, the reality sunk in. I'm about to experience heart surgery. It was the same with my friend Bram Willemser, who had terminal cancer for two years. 
for two years. His wife was a medical doctor. For two years, they walked this road together. And every now and again, he would phone me and talk about his cancer, talk about his family and his concern. But the week before his death, he phoned me. I'll never forget. I can remember that telephone conversation like yesterday. He phoned me and said, Rian, um, I don't know how long I've got to live, but I'm worried about my children. I'm worried about my wife. And he started sobbing, sobbing uncontrollably on the other side of the phone as I, I tried to reach out to him, but couldn't be there for him because he was in Cape Town. Just the anxiety that happened just before he died. I think it was something like that for, for Jesus there in the garden as he struggled with the Father. Tim Keller, a preacher that I follow, um, puts it like this. He says, Jesus was looking into the abyss. He was about to complete his life work, but that the completion of his life, up until now, it was healing the sick, doing this, doing that, teaching this, teaching that. But completing his life work would cost him terribly. Jesus was staring into the unthinkable. Isaiah the prophet, um, years before that, wrote about this very moment. What would happen from this point on in the life of Jesus. He, he wrote like this, he wrote about it like this in Isaiah 53. He said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So there Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, the reality is sinking in. And, and what would this mean is, is looking at the reality. Well, first of all, what it would mean is that Jesus would experience the full wrath of God on behalf of us. It was like swapping shoes with Jesus. We would get into Jesus' shoes, the innocent, and, we, and Jesus would get into our guilty shoes, the shoes of the guilty one. So every lie that you ever told, that was going to be on Jesus. If you've cheated... Um, whatever cheating you've done in your life, that would be on Jesus. If you cheated, if, if you committed adultery, that would be on Jesus, even though he was innocent. Um, every sin, not just your sin, not just my sin, but the sins of everyone would be on Jesus. And there in the garden, the reality of it all would sink in as Jesus, who could only see purity, looked into the darkness of everyone's sin. The reality that he was going to take all of that on himself, that he was going to be the guilty one, was starting to sink in in ways that it had never done before. There was going to be the physical torture for sure. <clears throat> and historians tell us how terrible that would be. But then we read that he would be completely separated from God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And this did happen on the cross. Remember Jesus shouting out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Three days of, of no love, no joy, no peace, just the wrath of God. Now for us, we, could, we, we think like, <clears throat> yes, Jesus died and then it was fast made for three days. But for Jesus, even not knowing the fellowship with the Father was unthinkable. Jesus looking into the abyss. Now, this was what was behind Jesus saying, is there another way? God, is there another way? Does it have to be like this? And guys, friends, this is what Easter Friday is about. Jesus, the innocent Son of God, experiencing the full wrath of Father God so that the guilty may be seen as innocent. Jesus died because of what you did, what I did wrong. Jesus died because of the curse that, that everyone is experiencing because of sin. Jesus looked into the abyss of God's wrath instead of us. He fell into the abyss of God's wrath instead of us. Now, I suppose one could ask the question, how could a loving God do this to his son? <clears throat> now, we need to remember here, <clears throat> Jesus is in the garden. He could... At any given point, he could pull out you. That's what this conversation was about. And in my mind, I think somewhere in, in human history, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son, the three persons of the Trinity, had a little caucus together. One God, three persons. They had a little conversation about, look look at the suffering. Look at, 
Look at kids being sick. Look at, look at diseases like we are experiencing <clears throat> on the earth right now through the coronavirus. Um, look at how people are making war and self-destructing. The consequences of sin. Is there anything we can do to help mankind? And then they come up with this plan that God would show his love to the world. In the words of Jesus himself, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God would show his love by making a way out for all of us. And the reality of all of that was sinking in for Jesus in his humanity there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as Jesus asks the Father, he says, isn't there another way? The Father says, there is no other way, my son. Um, is, there, is there no other way? Is there no, this is the only way. And then we have to realize in trying to answer this question, can a fair God, a loving God do this to his son? We need to note the next thing that happens here, Jesus decides to go through with it. It wasn't just the father, it was the son as well. This was a collaborative decision. Okay, Father, if there is no other way, you follow the story in my words. Note the determination from Jesus, verse 46. Rise, here comes my betrayer, it's time. The next few hours would be unspeakable torture. The next three days would be worse. It, would be, it was unthinkable. But he would do it because he is a God of love. He is a God who doesn't like to see little kids in a hospital bed. He is a God who doesn't like to see how we make war. He is a God who doesn't like to see how disease and poverty and everything else is destroying the objects of his love, the men and the women of this world. I've often wondered about the timing of this coronavirus. Um, why over Easter? I mean, this is a time when we try and get, reach out to as many people to tell the Jesus story. We do all kinds of things. We have Easter egg hunts. We, we put lots of hours into our worship services. The preaching goes in. We think deeply about the preaching. We challenge you guys to bring your friends to church. Um, maybe for this year, God wanted to take all of that the activity, the stuff away. Just for us to come to terms with the raw reality of Jesus' suffering and the raw reality of God's love for all of us. Jesus himself chooses. Jesus steps into our shoes of guilt. We should be suffering because of our guilt, but Jesus steps into our shoes. We, step in. we have the possibility of stepping into his shoes. We can become innocent where he becomes the guilty one. Maybe God wanted us to know, he wanted us to know this, that you can be forgiven and that your friendship can be restored. Maybe God just wanted to remove every conceivable distraction for us to be at home, for us to just be alone, for us to have time to think that there is a way out of the mis misery of this world, that God had made a way through Jesus. And that is what we are celebrating on Good Friday. And maybe God wanted us to know that we can decide to get out of our shoes of guilt and to get into the shoes of Jesus' innocence. And that actually, it's, it's not that difficult. That God gives us to us as a free gift. And when I think about how we can do that, I think of an old hymn that starts off like this. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame are what we should have suffered, the suffering of Jesus, the shame that we should have carried, the shame of Jesus. And, and the, the hymn goes on and it says, While well, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And, and the Bible gives us such clarity on how we can give our lives to God, how we can take our shoes from the shoes of guilt into the shoes of innocence. And we read about it in Romans 10. It simply says this, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Easter Friday is for everyone. And it's as simple as calling. And this is how to do it. 
Um, John 1 verse 8 says it like this. We claim to be without sin. If we claim to be without sin, and many of us do by the way we live our lives, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so John writes, he says, all that we have to do is we need to, we need to call on God and say, God, I have sinned. God, I am a liar. God, will you forgive me? God, I have cheated. I have done this. I have done that. I am the guilty one. God, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Will you help me? God, I have been unfaithful to my wife. God, is there a way? Is there a way for me to step into, into innocence again, into a place of forgiveness? Isaiah the prophet writes, and he answers that question like this. He says, <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 1, he speaks on God's behalf. He says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be white as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. There are a couple of things out of this passage. And first of all, God says, there is an invitation from God. It says, you know, if your sin, if your sin is like crimson, which is like red, like crimson, like red, like like the grape juice, <clears throat> um, I want to make it white. I want you to be innocent. I want you to be cleansed. That's what Isaiah says. God is saying to us. Um, he says, "Come, let us reason together." <clears throat> um, and 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 he says, "Come, I, I want to offer this to you as a free gift." But just come to me. Just come to me. Call on my name. Confess your sin. And I will remove your sin. Like this. Friends, the world is in crisis now. I mean, let's be honest. Let's just be very honest with ourselves. Everything that we hold dear has been cut off at the knees right now. The economy. Um... Um, we thought that we had plans about the future. We don't know how it's going to pan out. Um, hospitals have been emptied. We thought our medical uh, community will be able to help us from any disease. Well, hospitals have been emptied. There is stress worldwide about the impact of this. What will we look like after this post-coronavirus uh, virus time? We are in crisis. This is the curse. Um, this is as a result of the sin of mankind. But Easter Friday brings us the good news. The crisis that Jesus had in the garden was because Jesus didn't want things to be like this. He wanted to change this. <clears throat> but he was hoping that there was a better way. But there was no better way. And so Jesus deals with the crisis of our human condition, our guilt, our shame, the consequences of our sin. And he dies on the cross so that we can have a new life. And it just starts with a prayer. Call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Now, I want to challenge you this morning to consider doing what my dad did after 21 years of my life. One day in his hospital bed after a major heart attack, he asked God to come into his life afresh. To have a new start so that he could be a new man, that he could walk out of his shoes of guilt, step into his shoes of innocence, into the shoes of innocence of Jesus. And God answered his prayer right now. Um, and it's not that simple. You just have to pray a prayer. A prayer that will say, God, I'm calling on your name. Will you come into my life? Will you take over the steering wheel of my life? Will you take over control of my life? And God, will you give me my innocence again? So why don't, if you feel that, why don't you, why don't you pray this prayer with me? 
Um, God, I have done so many things that I should not have done. So many things that keep me from feeling your love. God, I acknowledge that I have sinned against you and the people around me. Will you forgive my sin? Will you help me to have a new life? Will you clean my life up? Help me to be right with you and those around me. God, I give my life to you. Um, will you now do with my life as you please? Amen. Now, if you have prayed that prayer, won't you let us know by just clicking on the link at the bottom of the screen that says, I have given my life to Jesus. I've decided to, to make a make a new turn in my life. I've asked God for forgiveness. I am I've asked him so that I could walk in in his shoes of innocence. We would love to connect with you in some way. Don't you want to connect with us um, via the church app or via Facebook? Or don't you want to connect with us just by clicking that link? Um, we would love to just follow up and help you on your spiritual journey. With the music playing right now, um, I want us to go into communion. Easter Friday, we always celebrate in this way. We take grape juice or wine and we take bread and we do what they did in the upper room. Um, <clears throat> and this is what happened in the upper room. Luke writes it like this. He says, when the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again. I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Basically, what Jesus was saying is, there's no magic in this. But you know, when you have communion, you remember what I did on Easter Friday. That I made a new way. And so this is what I want to suggest, how you do this. That if you are gathering together, that you would gather together, that you would pray over the cup. I will pray and I will, I will lead you into it, but that you would pray and just say, thank you for your broken body, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your blood that was poured out for me. If there are children in the group, why don't you let them participate? Why don't you just talk for a moment about Jesus' death and how that made it possible for us to be forgiven? And, and tell them and then say, we're going to have the bread together now. This bread that we are having together now, as it is broken, represents how people broke Jesus' body so our sin could be forgiven. And this represents the blood that was shed on our behalf. How Jesus bled out on Good Friday. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the body of Jesus that was broken for us like this. All because he loved and because you love us. Will you make it real to us, Holy Spirit? Thank you for the blood poured out for us. And we participate now doing what Jesus said. We remember. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to take communion now. Why don't you do the same? And um, we're going to have some music playing. You have communion. And why don't you close off this time? I'm going to end now with a prayer. You close off with your own time of communion and you have your own closing prayer. Father, thank you for this time we could worship together. And I pray that you would be with everyone now, wherever they are. As they remember, will you also bring life change 
I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so while you take communion, we just wanted to bless you by singing the song over you of your family. a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. With all the service has been an amazing blessing to you and your family and if you're still busy with communion just carry on and if you have some prayer together as a family don't forget to join us um, this coming sunday at 9 a.m we'll be celebrating the resurrection we love you church have a great day